Tonight, mounting calls for the UK to stop selling arms to Israel after the killing of three British aid workers by Israeli forces. Increasingly intolerable how Rishi Sunak describes the situation on the ground in Gaza as he demands a transparent, independent investigation into the aid worker deaths. The SNP demands Parliament be recalled to vote on stopping arms exports to Israel. We hear from the party's foreign affairs spokesman. Plus, the problem is there is no plan. A Sky News exclusive investigation finds a hollowed out military and no national defence plan would lead to scrambling disorder and early defeats in the event of an armed attack against the United Kingdom. Refusing to name names, Veterans Minister Johnny Mercer says he'll challenge an order to hand over the names of people who told him about alleged war crimes in Afghanistan. Could he face jail? And with the polls predicting a Labour landslide, could the coming election be a throwback to 1997? All that and more with Seb Payne and John McTurnan, who will be with me for the next hour. It's Wednesday. I'm Trevor Phillips, live from Westminster, and this is The Politics Hub. Hello, I'm sitting in for Sophie Ridge this week. Tonight, there are more than 20 serious wars going on across the globe. Last year, the death toll from Ukraine alone topped over 200,000 soldiers. In Israel and Gaza, over 30,000 since October the 7th. In the UK, we've been lucky. Since 1066, the only wars we fought on British soil have been against each other, what historians weirdly call civil wars. Generally speaking, we did our fighting in other people's lands, building the largest empire in history. Today, we no longer have distant shores to defend, but some military folk think that's made us smug and complacent. Other nations have more guns and more bombs. They're ahead of us in cyberware, biological weaponry, and space technology. Military bosses like to quote a maxim from the fourth century Roman writer, Flavius Vegetius. Roughly translated, it says, if you want peace, prepare for war. Well, it doesn't feel as though anyone's been paying much attention lately. My colleague Deborah Haynes has been pointing out today how unprepared we are. As a share of our national income, defence spending has halved over the 40 years since Margaret Thatcher dispatched the Naval Task Force to the Falklands. And even then, we had to rely on the Americans for much of the Expeditionary Force's work. And these days, even the firmest of alliances feel as if they're on shaky ground. Tonight, both Washington and Westminster are warning that Israel may have gone too far. First tonight, the question of whether the government has a plan for the defence of the United Kingdom against the backdrop of moving to what ministers have described as a pre-war world. Sky News can exclusively, re exclusively reveal that we do not. But officials are now starting to develop a cross-government national defence plan. Here's Sky's security and defence editor, Deborah Haynes, with her report. When the Cold War ended, Mike Parrish picked up a hot bargain. A top-secret nuclear bunker built by the government under his family's farmland. So would we be safe once we got to this part? Well, yes, safer than being outside, obviously, because you've got the blast door to go through to start with. Now a tourist attraction, it's taken on a new relevance amid warnings of future war. The United Kingdom was heavily attacked with nuclear weapons at one o'clock this afternoon. This safe house in Essex was one of a network of bunkers tasked with keeping the country running after a nuclear strike. The scale of this bunker underlines how seriously governments during the Cold War took the threat of nuclear attack and global conflict. Thankfully, these defences were never actually needed, but at least they had a plan that was resourced and regularly rehearsed. In the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, 
Britain has warned of a pre-war world. Yet sources say there's currently no national plan for the defence of the UK if war breaks out. Tucked away in the National Archives are some of this country's old plans. The government war book detailed how the nation would transition from peace to war, but it was phased out after the collapse of the Soviet Union. While the UK relies on its nuclear weapons and NATO membership to deter threats, officials are understood to be developing a cross-government national defence plan. Asked about the allegation that there's no plan for war, a Cabinet Office spokesperson said, The UK has robust plans in place for a range of potential emergencies and scenarios, with plans and supporting arrangements developed, refined and tested over many years. But, the end of the tunnel, but there are still worries about Britain's hollowed-out defences as global threats Hiroshima. grow. Do you think this bunker might have to come back to life again? It would obviously be something one would contemplate. I've got the keys and um, I'll be down here. National preparations for war perhaps no longer a practice of the past. And Deborah Haynes is here with me now. Deborah, are we ready for war? Do we need to spend more? Well, we're, no and yes. <laughs> we're clearly not ready for war. And uh, it is it's kind of it's understandable in a way that uh, the, the, the posture of the government has changed since the end of the Cold War. Those plans that you saw there that are in the National Archives, they, they're incredibly complex. They cover everything from mobilising the reserves to moving national artwork out of the galleries here in London to keep them safe. And that kind of planning is obviously really expensive. So when the Cold War finished, and uh, Tony Blair's government, actually, it was in that sort of era that these uh, books were phased out. It was a time of counter-terrorism, the wars, the expeditionary wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and they were the focus, and this shift went to civil contingencies, which is what the government now talks about. The thing that is hard to understand, though, is following Russia's initial invasion of Ukraine in 2014 and then the full-scale invasion in 2022, when the, the, the dynamics, the paradigm, the security situation in Europe reverted back to that Cold War-style threat, aggression from Russia, nuclear-armed Russia, a leader in Russia who's talking about nuclear weapons, why the government, and this is not just a defence thing, this mm. should be led from the Cabinet Office, the Prime Minister is not thinking about, or has not developed a war plan, they're thinking about one. I mean, that's not a plan. Yeah. I suppose that the, the, the uninformed view would be, well, we don't have to do much of this because uh, if it was Russia, they'd have to get through the Germans and the French and everybody else before they get to us. And by that time, we've got ourselves ready. Uh, is that a sensible view or not? Well, I mean... In modern world warfare? In modern warfare, definitely not. And it clearly wasn't in the Cold War. Our geography hasn't changed. NATO's borders, of course, have expanded. Um, but the, the fact is that the UK, it relies on its nuclear deterrence. We've got a, a, a nuclear-armed submarine, four of them, one permanently deployed, ready to, to act, ready to launch. And we're a member of the world's biggest defence alliance in NATO. But I've been told that the problem is inside government Officials think that deterrence will work and they don't ask, what if it doesn't work? And that's when you, it takes you back to those years in the Cold War when we had a much deeper, more capable defence force and a much more resilient population, a more resilient industrial base and a government, a whole of government that was thinking about this much more coherently. Deborah, thank you so much for chilling me to my bones. My pleasure. <laughs> Well, listening to that is former Defence Secretary uh, Sir Michael Fallon. Um, Sir Michael, do you agree that we aren't spending what we should be spending? Yes, I do. We need to be spending more. The threat has increased. And we didn't have, even you know, in the Cold War that Debbie's been describing, we didn't have Russia invading countries on our continent. So the threat is much more serious than it was. 
and we therefore need to increase our spending. And that's the purpose of the cross-party initiative that uh, I've been involved with, with the Council for Geostrategy, to get all parties to commit to that to spend 2.5% of GDP in the next parliament. 2.5% is um, it, it's, it's quite a small ambition, isn't it? Because uh, uh, the year after the Falklands War, 1984, um, we were spending at 5.5% of GDP. It's now down towards 2 or possibly below 2, depending how you measure, measure it. Is, that even, is even that goal going to be anything like enough, given the scale of threat across the globe? Well, we dropped our spending after the Cold War uh, throughout the, uh, the 90s and the 2000s, but the threat has risen. We're spending about 2.1%. We're spending in line with the NATO target, but there are other countries now in Europe that are spending more, the Baltic states, Hungary. Uh, there are other countries, that, Romania, not, you know, not nearly as wealthy as us. And so the, what we want the political parties, all the candidates to focus on now, is a new benchmark. And we've set that benchmark at 2.5%. Now, that, by the way, would mean spending around eight or nine billion pounds a year more than we're spending at the moment. And this is at a time, of course, when everybody wants as for their favourite things they'd like to spend more on. So that would be a start. And to get that across the politics so that all candidates in this year's general election commit to that higher target, that, I think, would be the first step to making this country better defended. It's quite uh, difficult for the current government to make that argument because actually the, uh, the slope, if you look at defence spending, has gone, you know, it's, it's as I said, uh, fallen by half in the last 40 years. And a lot of that has taken place under conservative leadership of the country. In fact, the steepest slope was, uh, in, in, oddly enough, in the Thatcher and Major era. After um, the end of the Cold War, uh, yes. Well, it's been increasing in the last... It, uh, Certainly in the it, last that, that fall started in 1984, which was yeah. before the end of the Cold, Cold War. So what, what, what do you think caused that? Was it, it wasn't just the end of the Cold War, was it? Well, it was part <coughs> of the end of the Cold War. You know, the wall came down in 1989, and uh, a lot of countries then, we withdrew our troops from Western Germany, for example. We pulled back, and uh, we didn't need the scale of, of weaponry that we need. But the threat now is much, much greater. We have a war going on on our continent. We have British ships being sunk out in the Gulf. We have uh, international terrorism still on our doorstep. The threat has magnified, and therefore, we need to beef up our defences. I suspect that um, uh, some, some defence experts would say that's all well and good, but it's not just the money. It's what we spend it on, isn't it? Uh, and that, Are we p positioned to spend it in the right places. I mean, in modern warfare, it isn't just... There, there are two sets of things. One is, it isn't just putting large numbers of men and women on soil, number one. And number two, you have cyber warfare and so forth. And number two, there are non-state actors. Hamas, for example. Is, Indeed. Who, these are not conventional wars being fought. Uh, are we spending in the right place to meet those threats? Well, we can always spend more efficiently. I learned that in my time at the Ministry of Defence. Everybody can point to particular programmes that overran in terms of time or in terms of budget. And we do need to keep adjusting to the technology that our opponents are developing. And that means looking again at missile defence, looking at our cyber defence, looking at uh, the aut autonomous weapons that are now being used, and learning from what's happening in Ukraine where all kinds of technologies, including drones, are now being used by both sides. You were, uh, you were Defence Secretary for, what, three, four years? Uh, three and a half years. Yeah, in three, uh, three and a half years. Um, I don't know how to put this, uh, so I'll put it indelicately. Uh, this thinking is not particularly new to you. You didn't get the machine to move, did you? You didn't get the Treasury to stump up. We started to increase the budget, yes. We hit 2%, the NATO target, on my watch back in 2016. So we slowly so started reversing. Flat. No, that's not quite right. We slowly started reversing the earlier cuts that were made at the beginning of the austerity programme, if you remember, back in 2010. So the budget has been riding. And to be fair to my successors and to successive uh, prime ministers, the budget has been slowly increasing. However, the threat has been multiplying. And that's the difference now. That's why we need to step up a gear. And that's why we'd like every candidate in this election to commit to a new target of 2.5%. Let me ask you about another angle of this. Um, of course, central to 
pretty much every defence strategy, and there have been plenty of them since the uh, Second World War, has been the nature of partnership, the notion of partnership, and uh, central to that has been NATO and our relationship with the United States. What happens if we get a President Trump? Well, we need to do what uh, President Trump has advised us to do and what successive presidents advised us to do. It was President Obama who came to the Wales summit 10 years ago when we adopted the 2% target. That wasn't Trump. That was Obama. Successive American presidents have always said that Europe should be spending more. And that's why we need to lead on this. Uh, less than half, fewer than half the NATO members now spend the 2%, and they had 10 years to get there after the 2014 Wales summit. Less, fewer than half have actually made it. So we need to be cajoling the rest of the alliance and setting an example. Some countries on the eastern side of NATO are now doing that. Poland, for example, the Baltic states, as I said, Romania and Hungary are now spending much more, and we should be leading. Can we persuade some of the laggards to, uh, to, to join? When you say there's, it's cross-party, cross-party in this country, but of course there are other um, NATO members and other European countries who aren't doing quite as much as, uh, as I think you would like them to do. No, it's a, it's a collective alliance, but, you know, NATO has been a very successful defensive alliance. Countries want to join it and have joined it. Finland and Sweden have joined in the last uh, year or so. So it's, it's a stronger alliance all the time. But the, the answer to... Trump is not to keep fretting about Trump, but to do what the Americans want us to do. And by the way, that's across the board in America, Republicans and Democrats. They want Europe to spend more on its own defence. They see our continent being invaded by Russia and they expect us to do more about it, and we should. Let me ask you, uh, just uh, finally, um, what, have you spoken to uh, the, anybody in the Treasury about this, because, of course, Mr Shapps has been pretty... Uh, the Defence Secretary has been pretty clear that he would support this. Uh, but are we getting any of that from the rest of government? Well, I continue to talk to my former colleagues in government. I think government understands that uh, they need to, be, to keep rising the defence budget. Um, they will have a spending review if they're re-elected next year. Um, the Labour Party will have a defence review if Labour win power. So this is an opportunity, actually, for both parties, you know, to, to start afresh and to look and to adopt a new kind of spending target. That's what the public, I think, would expect. I congratulate you on your optimism and getting any money out of the Treasury on, on this. But uh, we shall no doubt be re returning to this before the election, assuming the election's later in the year. Michael Fallon, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. The ongoing fallout from the aid worker deaths is sure to feature in tomorrow's papers. We'll have our extended press preview and news review from 10.30 this evening with tonight's news and tomorrow's headlines. Joining us will be the Daily Mirror's associate editor, Kevin Maguire, and the Telegraph's deputy comment editor, Annabelle Denham. You're watching The Politics Hub. Coming up... Refusing to name names, Veterans Minister Johnny Mercer challenges orders to identify whistleblowers. Plus, a major poll predicts a Labour landslide. We'll have the analysis. And after the break, we hear from the SNP's Foreign Affairs spokesman, Brendan O'Hara, who wants a recall of Parliament to debate a weapons sale halt. It's one of the most dramatic sights in nature. A total solar eclipse, when day turns to night in a rare and spectacular sight. Join millions of people across Mexico, the US and Canada and watch the total eclipse live in a special program on Sky News.
I mean, a recent study proved that with some beagles, those that had um, training after about the age of six were much more on the ball than those that didn't. I suppose you could say it's a no-brainer. Hey. So, you know, just with us, as with us, Kay, keeping yourself mentally dexterous, doing a crossword puzzle every day. Mr Binks, you're going on a bit of an adventure there. <laughs> Come back. <laughs> Binks. So keeping your dog um, alert, boy. doing little tricks like maybe going into a down now, maybe turning away, not facing the camera, but we don't mind. Um, looking out for feeding your dogs a very healthy diet. So cutting out all the complex carbs, a bit like we're recommended to not eat overly processed foods every single day. Like we're recommended to get out and about, take in the fresh air, take up a new hobby, socialise a lot. And the interesting thing is, by owning a dog, <laughs> thinks by owning a dog, yeah. um, you actually tick so many of those boxes without having to try, Kay, because you're out walking your dog, you're out meeting other dog owners, so you're socialising, you feel like you're in a club. Um, so it's interesting to note that dog owners do tend to not get dementia as much as those people that don't own a dog. And it's all about going to the different places to see the different faces. And, um, and that keeps dogs alert um, and minimises um, dementia. But for me as well, it's the gut-brain axis that we're being told about very much on a human level. And you know, Kay, that you are what you eat. Yeah. So keeping the dog's food healthy, Boy. keeping the dog eating foods that dogs are meant to eat, so lots of fresh meat, and antioxidants will also keep him really alert. But you see, he's looking around, he's yeah. well perky. After the killing of seven charity workers in Gaza, including three Britons, there are increasing calls for the UK and the US to stop arms sales to Israel. The SNP is calling for MPs to cut short their Easter break and come back to Parliament to debate stopping arms export licences for Israel. The party says it wants Parliament to do more to increase pressure on Israel to call an immediate ceasefire. We'll hear from their foreign affairs spokesman, uh, Brendan O'Hara, in just a moment. But first, the tone from the UK government has shifted markedly since the aid attacks. Rishi Sunak described the situation in Gaza as increasingly intolerable. Awful, awful tragedy to think that these were brave Brits who were actually risking their lives to bring aid to people in need in Gaza to have lost their lives in these circumstances is tragedy. My thoughts, obviously, with their family and their friends at this time. You know, I spoke to Prime Minister Netanyahu last night and was very clear with him that the situation is increasingly intolerable and what we urgently need to see is a thorough, transparent investigation into what has happened, uh, but also a dramatic increase in the amount of aid getting into Gaza, removing the barriers, uh, but also closer work with aid agencies to make sure things like this don't happen again. And earlier, Foreign Secretary Lord Cameron sent a message to Israel that the UK is watching closely. Uh, I welcome what the Israeli Foreign Minister said yesterday to me about a full, urgent and transparent inquiry into how this dreadful event was allowed to happen. And we want to see that happen very, very quickly. I also welcome the fact that he spoke about much more aid getting into Gaza, up to 500 trucks a day. That is essential. We've been promised these things before, and this really needs to happen, including longer opening times at the vital crossing points. But, of course, the extra aid won't work unless there is proper deconfliction, unless aid can be taken around Gaza and we avoid the dreadful incidents like we see, we've seen in the last couple of days. That is vital, and Britain will be watching very closely to make sure that that happens. Well, 
I spoke to the SNP Foreign Affairs spokesperson, Brendan O'Hara, a little earlier. Mr O'Hara, you're re demanding that Parliament be recalled. Why? I think it's absolutely essential that, given the, the tragedy that we saw last night in Gaza, that the Prime Minister comes to Parliament and outlines exactly what his response will be. And members of Parliament have to be able to scrutinise that response and critique that response. Uh, and it'll give us, once again, the opportunity to press our case for an immediate ceasefire as well as an immediate end to the sale of arms to, to Israel. If we don't come back now, if we are not recalled now, then it'll be a, the 15th of April before Parliament can discuss this. Well, there are two separate things here, aren't there? One is mourning, if you like, and marking the tragic loss of life here. And the second is the broader issue of the ceasefire. Um, which one is this recall supposed to deal with? And what would be the point? I, I th I, I, well, the, the point would be that three UK nationals who have been delivering aid into Gaza have been killed by the IDF. And now there is a possibility that the weapons that were used to kill them were partly made in the United Kingdom. Now, we don't know that, but we don't not know that. And if we are supplying weapons to the IDF which are being used to kill aid workers, then I think that the Prime Minister has an urgent responsibility to explain what he's going to do about that. And we, as parliamentarians, have a responsibility to make sure that we are aware of what his actions are going to be. Okay, can we put this in, in context, though? I mean, um, our exports, military exports, uh, to Israel account for not point new not 2% of their expenditure. We are Israel's 41st largest trading partner. Um, in what way would a debate in our parliament put any pressure on Israel to do anything different? Historically, we have been one of Israel's most staunch allies. We have stood by Israel every step of the way. And the historical links between the UK and Israel are incredibly deep. They have really, really deep roots. And the optics of the United Kingdom saying to Israel, enough is enough. You know, you've gone too far and we cannot be seen to be supporting this really would be hugely significant. Oh, I don't think you can underestimate Do you really think that the Israelis, that the Israelis, not just the Israeli government, the Israeli people, who have been through the trauma that followed October the 7th uh, and are still uh, dealing with the fact that I think, what, 100 plus hostages are still held in Gaza, uh, are really now going to be thinking about, uh, forgive me putting it this way, sentimental historic links? No, perhaps not. But I think what it would send a message to the rest of the world that the United Kingdom oh. finally, as it is, recognising that it, or accepting that it will no longer be complicit in what Israel is doing in Gaza. Because right now, you know, we have that absurd situation where the UK is parachuting in aid at the same time as missiles, which could well have been partly made in the United Kingdom, are bombing Gaza. So we're supplying aid and missiles. And I think the level of cognitive dissonance that is required to justify that is absolutely startling. But I don't think we should get away from the, the, the human tragedy that families in this country are experiencing tonight. Well, indeed, that's exactly the point I'd like just finally to come back to. It is a human tragedy. And um, I, I, let me put it to you this way. The likelihood that the recall of Parliament will make any difference to anybody very much is very small. It will be a theatre in which our politics can be played out. Do you really think that is proper in the light of the tragedy that is taking place, that we turn this into a wider political uh, argument between our parties? 
This is one of the most pressing and important issues of our time. Millions of people across these islands have marched demanding a ceasefire and an end to arms sales. There is a famine, a man-made famine developing in Gaza. And those brave, selfless people who put their lives at risk and lost their lives last night were delivering food aid to a starving population. And in killing them, the result has been that the ships carrying food have been turned round. So I think this you cannot divorce any of this from another part of it. And we have to take a stand. We have to say enough is enough. And we Thank have you. to ask the question, what more can the UK do before, or what more can Israel do before the UK stops selling them arms? Mr. O'Hara, thank you very much for your time this evening. Thank you very much. Let's bring in our dynamic duo for tonight. <laughs> Author and director of the think tank Onward, Seb Payne, and former advisor to the Labour Party under Tony Blair, John McTurnan. Um, let's just start with th that last interview. Seb, do you think that uh, a recall of Parliament has any purpose? Not really at this point. There's so much we don't know about this awful tragedy that we've seen in Gaza. Um, and we're still trying to find out what's going on. And we've heard from both Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer that we need an urgent investigation from um, the Israel side on what happened here and uh, what was responsible and why this tragedy happened. That's what matters, not Parliament coming back to debate this, because I don't really see what that would achieve. And it's actually a bit gut-wrenching when we see these awful signs from guards to see that there are some people who are out there trying to use this to confirm positions and prejudices they already have about this conflict, that there are people who have been calling for arms embargoes for a long time and are now using this to try and push that case forward. That's not what this is about. This is about trying to figure out what happened and to make sure it doesn't happen again in this awful war. Uh, John, I noticed that uh, Labour hasn't um, piled in behind this one. No, look, I think the... I welcome the words of David Cameron. I welcome the words uh, of... Um... Rishi Sunak reported from last night the strong words he's using. Uh, I think it's right for Labour to stand behind the government on this one. I do think there's an issue, a broader political issue, about Gaza and uh, Israel-Palestine in our politics. If it's not addressed properly within the main political parties, there is a demand for out of five people in the country wanting immediate see an immediate ceasefire. If it's not expressed through our parliament, through our main parties, it is expressed through fringe parties like George Galloway's Workers' Party. So I think there's a danger to not feeling an empathy, not just with um, the families who've lost loved ones, uh, but also an empathy with the, 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 the broad mass of the public in, in Britain who want to see the ceasefire that Britain voted for uh, in the United Nations uh, Security Council recently, that Parliament voted for uh, on that day when there's lots of procedural wrangling. And I think a sense of leadership, which I do see from David Cameron, I respect what he's doing on this. I think in that sense, if there's not, if there's a vacuum, then the extremes of, 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 of politics, whether it's the SNP trying to play politics or George Galloway playing politics, and that's a danger. You do need a political discussion discussed politically in the right forum. And I do think you can see that the UK's position has changed on this, that following the horrific October the 7th attack, and we should, of course, remember throughout all this, those hostages still remain in Gaza at the moment, and there's been no serious attempt um, from Hamas to release them, which is what would uh, bring the end to this war the quickest and safest way possible. Um, the, the fact is that the UK has started off full square behind Israel and has gradually grown more critical. And if you look at the readout between the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and Benjamin Netanyahu, it is one of the toughest diplomatic readouts I've ever seen from a prime minister to openly criticise and use tough language about their allies on that. So you can feel patience is wearing thin. And where the UK can do its best is corralling international support, is working with the UN, is working with its allies to put pressure on this. Because as you highlighted yeah. in your questions, Ooh. Trevor, the fact is the UK's arms sales are very minimal and are not going to make a difference to this. What can make a difference is diplomacy. And that's why it's good to see that there is mainstream political consensus on this. And I do think, John, to your point, that the, the, the overall mainstream position is reflecting that disquiet in the country. And in the end, it's the Americans who can turn the tap on the and off. No, the Americans supply all the defence. The Americans are the diplomatic uh, powerhouse. Mm -hmm. um, Joe Biden has his own internal US political uh, management. He's got to actually deal with the, the demands of American voters for, 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 for peace and some kind of settlement. And look, um, 
I know Seb has just said that Hamas could stop this immediately. The thing is, this, this war and all the slaughter has probably created generations of recruits for Hamas. Um, it, it, they've had six months, the, the Israeli government, to, in, in, in Gaza. They have not eliminated um, uh, Hamas. Uh, they've probably created new generations. That's why we need peace and the proper negotiated peace. Um, just a, a word on the conversation I had with Michael Fallon. Um, I wonder whether everybody seems to agree we should spend more on defence, arguments about where that money is going to come from. But I wonder if one of the things that we might be missing, Deborah Haynes's piece has been very yeah. persuasive on this, is a plan for war as she is fought now. It's also a plan on how to spend more money for defence because we've seen, for example, um, Tom Tuckenhat, the security minister, said quite recently we need to get to 2.5% of GDP on defence now. But to do that, you've got to have the procurement in place. You've got to have the supply chains in place. You've got to have the right base of the MOD to do that. So everyone agrees... Aircraft carriers money. don't build themselves in 10 minutes. But also, exactly. like... Also, we've been in a defensive alliance, which we, the Labour government, founded, NATO. That's the way we orient ourselves in, in, against the risk of an attack. And, and the, dirty, the dirty secret of British politics is that the, the security of Britain will be anchored in deeper cooperation with France. That's the logic, the obvious logic. We can't trust America if Trump comes back. We, have to, we actually have to work much closer on Anglo-French cooperation. They're our nearest neighbours, okay. they're our closest allies apart from Ireland, and they should actually be working with us. But I don't think that doesn't mean we haven't got more work to do here at home, though. Of course you work closely with France, of course you work closely with NATO, but we've got to have our own sovereign domestic capabilities which need strengthening. That's not a thing you hear very often. Let's get closer to the French. <laughs> On that bombshell, you're watching The Politics Hub, coming up. With another poll predicting a huge Labour win, we'll look back at 1997, the last time there was a Labour landslide. After the break, refusing to name names, Veterans Minister Johnny Mercer challenges orders to identify whistleblowers.
Veterans Minister Johnny Mercer is at the centre of a row today. He's challenging an order to hand over the names of those who told him about alleged war crimes by British Special Forces in Afghanistan. The MP has until this Friday to provide a witness statement with the names to an independent inquiry. And if he isn't going to hand over the names, he had a deadline of today to explain why not. Well, rather than provide a written submission setting out those reasons, instead today Mr Mercer said he was submitting an application to challenge the order. The Afghanistan inquiry insists that the information will be treated in confidence and warned that failure to comply could result in prison. Well, here's some of Mr Mercer's defiant appearance at the inquiry a few weeks back. This court doesn't intimidate me. You don't intimidate me. I will try and help you. Let me finish. I will try and help you as much as I can. But that is the same for individuals who will come across this court. They are not intimidated by being in this court. There are greater issues at stake. And you are not going to get there if you persistently say, make out or infer through your questioning that I, I am not helping you or I'm not here to tell the truth. Well, Sky's political correspondent, Matthew Thompson, is here. Matt, what now? What's the prospect for uh, Johnny Mercer? Well, look, I can confirm that, as stated, Johnny Mercer has submitted that application ahead of today's deadline. So that's the first thing. But I think before we get into the detail of what happens next, I think it's worth a step back just to sort of appreciate what is at stake here. So Johnny Mercer's evidence to the Afghanistan inquiry in February was incendiary. I mean, he's essentially claiming that he's been told by serving members of the armed forces, serving special forces officers, that there were alleged war, war crimes in Afghanistan. We're talking about essentially the deliberate killing of detainees by British special forces. And that includes, for example, uh, Mr Mercer saying that someone had told him, a special forces person had told him about being told to carry what's called a drop weapon. Now what that is is essentially a weapon that could be planted on the body of somebody killed by British Special Forces to give the impression that they had been a threat when they had not. Now that is fairly extraordinary stuff and it gets to the heart of exactly what the inquiry is trying to do. So the inquiry, perhaps understandably, wants the names of the people who spoke to Johnny Mercer so it can find this information out. Johnny Mercer, on the other hand, well, look, he says these people came to me in confidence. Ultimately, he thinks it's, it's crucially important that whistleblowers feel they can come to MPs and ministers and not have their names spread any further. And he's had support in that position from people like General Lord Dannett, the former head of the army. So that brings us to where we are now. Now, he's, he's submitted this application and ultimately, it's up to the chair of, of the inquiry to decide whether his reasons are acceptable or not. If he decides they aren't, and we don't yet have a timescale on this decision, as you said in the introduction, he could face a fine of up to £1,000 or a prison term Blimey, of up you, to 51 weeks. Could see the handcuffs on... Uh, so the stakes are high. And also, I should point out that if he is... Does, does fall foul of the law. I mean, he's a minister, right? He, that, that would potentially be in breach of the ministerial code. The prime minister might have to make a decision as to whether to sack him or not. So, look, who knows what the decision will be in the short term, but the, the, the stakes here, I suppose, are incredibly high, whichever way you look at it. And it's pretty uh, important for Merce himself, as he's a former soldier. So yeah. the, he's sort of caught in some kind of conflict. He's a minister, but he doesn't, doesn't want to snitch on his mates. Yeah, and also he feels that there's a, there's a credibility issue at stake here. You know, look, in the journalism profession, we know all about protecting sources, and he feels that it's very important for the future of the armed forces that people feel when they have problems to raise, they can do so in confidence. Wow. It's a bit like a movie. Matt, thanks very much. Now, a new opinion poll is predicting that Labour will win more than 400 seats at the next general election and push the Conservatives into an even worse result than under John Major in 1997. The YouGov polling of more than 18,500 voters shows Labour would win 403 seats, leading to a majority of 154 in the House of Commons. 11 cabinet ministers would be on course to lose their seats, including Jeremy Hunt, Penny Mordaunt and Grant Shapps. Well, Sky's chief political correspondent, John Craig, is here. And, John, you know all about this. I do, yes. I mean, uh, it's extraordinary. I mean, I'm sceptical, I have to say, the idea that Labour are going to win a Blair-style landslide, um, because, of course, you think back to 97, 
John Major had lost his majority in Parliament, whereas now the government's still got a working majority of 50 or 60 in the House of Commons, and the government is winning votes by 70 every night. So, as Sir Keir Starmer rightly says, Labour do have a mountain to climb. Now, this poll suggests that the result will be worse than 97. What is worse is their prediction of 155 seats. In 97, the Tories won 165, but Labour won uh, 418. So, in fact, the Labour majority was bigger, bigger then. It was 179. Um, other highlights, well, the Lib Dems up to uh, 49. That's the sort of level they were at under Paddy Ashdown, uh, uh, Charles Kennedy and Nick Clegg. SNP losing 29 in Scotland down to 19. The, one of the flaws, I think, of this poll is that it, the question was asked, and it, as you say, it's a massive poll, nearly 19,000 people. If there was a general election tomorrow, how would you vote? Well, there's not going to be a general election tomorrow. It could be more than six months away. As Rishi Sunak was saying, campaigning in the northeast of England yesterday, he's still working towards the second half of this year. He hopes the economy will improve. The Tories will hope that all the undecided voters will come back to them, that reform who are at... Uh, yeah, I was going to ask you, what's happening on Yeah, that? reform are uh, at 12% uh, in this poll. The Tories will hope they've peaked. I mean, the reform... OK, they, they talk a good game and they do quite well in opinion polls, but they, they, they don't actually do that well when it comes to an election. There were six, I seem to recall, in Rochdale. They won't win any seats, as this poll confirms. Of course, potentially, they can damage the Tories if they're up at 12%, which is the same as the Lib Dems. I mean, they will argue... 12%, Lib Dems set to get 49 seats. Reform, 12%, no seats. Uh, they're going to come second in a lot of seats, whereas the Lib Dems, you've mentioned some of the names there, the, uh, that Godalming and Ash seat, which uh, Jeremy Hunt's going to be defending, long been a... That part of the world's long been a, a, a Lib Dem target. There are others. Jacob Rees-Mogg, perhaps, could be vulnerable down in Somerset. Ian Duncan-Smith... But these are, these are big names, though. Yeah, they They've got go. their own personal following, right? Well, I mean, we all, we all said, didn't we, in 90, saying, were you up for Portillo? It might be, were yeah, you up yeah. for Jeremy Hunt this well, time round? <laughs> that, that's a slogan that nobody wants, <laughs> nobody wants to go he but, would, I mean, he <laughs> would be... You don't often see a chance for the Exchequer lose his or her seat in a, in a general election. Um, it's, it's good news for Labour. It's reassuring for them because it suggests that the, their poll lead is not narrowing, as some feared it might. I mean, I still think it probably will between now and late yeah. October or November uh, because uh, opposition's poll leads do tend to shrink a bit. that's what happens. Yeah. I mean, I, I've been very struck at the stability of Labour. I mean, it's, it's been 20 points all the way yeah. for the last year or so. Um, do you think this kind of polling is going to affect the decision that Rishi Sunak makes about the timing? Probably not. What it will do is uh, give, give those pesky Tory backbenchers, those mutineers, give them more calls to say, he's got to go, he's got to go. But I think the danger time for Mr Sunak, obviously, is after May the 2nd. That, I think, will perhaps be a better guide to uh, where voters are when you've got local elections, mayoral elections, will the Tories hold on to Andy Street and Lord Houch... Uh, in the West Midlands West Midlands, Mayor. Andy Street, where the Prime Minister was, Teesside. Um... What about the Blackpool South by-election? What? How will that, that one go? Will reform make any inroads there? It's a big Lipro leave seat. Um, I think we'll learn probably a bit more from real voters casting their votes. I mean, I'm slightly sceptical about this poll, as I say. And uh, I also think uh, reform rather overperform in polls and underperform when it comes to the actual votes. Well, you're going to be, you'll be watching it as ever. I, viewers, John and I have been doing this for, what, 40 years? Uh, but uh, we'll, like look, <laughs> we'll look forward to further, <laughs> further information as it uh, arises. Thanks, John. You are watching The Politics Hub. Coming up... Well, you've heard what uh, John Craig had to say there. The polls are predicting a Labour landslide, the like of which we haven't seen since Tony Blair. So, after the break, we're going to ask ourselves, Will this be a 97 election? We'll debate that. Coming up on the UK tonight at 8, tributes to three British aid workers killed in Gaza, with a candlelit vigil taking place tonight. As a Sky News investigation reveals the government has no national plan for the defence of the UK, we'll ask a former British Army colonel who led thousands of men and women into war in Iraq whether we need to be more prepared. And after 10,000 drivers signed a petition opposing modern car headlights, 
The government is to investigate whether they're too bright. That's the UK tonight at 8. Dowd and I'm Sky's Midlands correspondent. We can reveal that the driver who hit Harry Dunn is 42-year-old Anne Sekoulas. Just met the president and we never thought we'd get this far. This is what they're up against, is back-breaking work. Water levels are dropping, but no one knows what impact further rain will have. What would you do if this place wasn't open? We take you to the heart of the stories that shape our world. It's really scary. In this community, I'm told that everybody knows someone affected by COVID. Change seems tantalisingly close in this corner of the UK. This is my patch, my specialism. It's also my home. Welcome back to the Politics Hub. Now, cast your minds back to 1997. Bill Clinton was in the White House. Jerry Halliwell wore that Union Jack dress at the Brit Awards. And a pint of lager cost about three quid, if you're lucky. It all feels a lifetime ago, but with polls predicting a Labour landslide, is politics about to go all 90s retro? If so, there's a flavour of that 97 election here. Seb and John, you know, two annoying things about that. First of all, more royalties for Brian Cox and D. Ream. And secondly, Tony Blair has not put on an ounce since those <laughs> days. Really annoying. Seb, um, what do you think? This look, does this shape up to look like 97? Does it feel like... Well, you were... A, yeah, you were... OK, let's imagine that you were an adult. <laughs> Does it look like 97? Well, I can say, actually, I was alive in 97, <laughs> and I do remember going to a polling station on 1997 election with my mum and my dad in that day, and I remember that palpable sense of Tony Blair becoming Prime Minister, and of the feelings across the country, and I was going up the northeast of England, which had a lot of support for uh, Mr Blair at that point of view. I don't think the vibes today are the vibes as they were now, no matter what you see of polling. How the country felt about Tony Blair, and I think even John might agree with this, is not how the country feels about Keir Starmer right now. And there's a lot more volatility in politics than there was back then. And there isn't that sense that everything is definitely going on this kind of big direction towards Tony Blair with Keir Starmer. John, you were there. I was there and... We were all nervous. We weren't fully trusting the polls. The day of the election was quiet. The evening was fantastic. I came out at the Royal Festival Hall. There were people lined along Waterloo Bridge and they applauded every single person that came out. They were applauding themselves. They were applauding a country that had the courage to change. And I think this is where I see a connection. The country's seen governments which have really driven out hope from politics. The hope that things can change, can not get better, but change, that change is 
promised and then never delivered. And I think that's the thing which Keir is tapping into. He's offering change. People want change. That's what the by-elections tell us, the MRPs tell us, I, the voting entry polls. There's a, there's, there's a big landslide coming, bigger than uh, 97, bigger than 45 or 66. Um, the country does want something. I mean, if Labour is a stick to beat the government, um, big, that's fine. Bigger than 97, Jay McTernan, <clears throat> we have yeah. it on, on tape. But do you really think that um, what this is going to be about is more that Labour is offering hope and less... We're sick of the Tories. I mean, which, Labour, Labour which, which, is, <clears throat> which is going here? So two things are happening, I think. Labour's offering change, and it's a rapid change. You know, it took... Um, we lost so badly in 1983, it took till 97 to come back, 14 years. This is four years since the last big defeat. Labour's come back big. Also, the country is trending progressive, 66%, 65%, voting Lib Dem, Green... Labour, SNP, so, Plaid. Yeah, I mean, I just... Big change. Yeah, but of course, that, it's a big change where, obviously, just five years ago, four and a bit years ago, we had an 80 seat <coughs> Conservative majority. So I think politics is a lot more volatile. Social media has made it much easier to vote for challenger parties. And in these polls today, it's interesting you can see reform parties polling very well. And that's one of the reasons you're seeing these big Labour numbers. And I do think the reform vote will collapse a bit when we get towards the election, but... OK. Sorry. That is all we've got time for tonight. It's me again tomorrow night at 7. I'll see you in next It's a UK Tonight. <laughs>